Bob Boys and Girls, good evening and welcome to this Friday night edition of Cave Side with Christopher James. I'm Christopher James. Hope you're ready to have a good time tonight. It's Friday. It's Good Friday for you folks out there that are celebrating the uh, Good Friday and Easter weekend. Um, you know, hope you didn't eat any today. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Make sure you share this everywhere you can, you know, because that's how we do this. Maybe we get the word out. So I'm starting a little bit late tonight. Uh, the reason being, uh, my guest list tonight, Brock Weaver, Jason House, Joe Selecki, and Giga Chikadze. Um, Brock Weaver was having some technical issues on his end. So we're going to bring him on at the end of the program. So uh, he'll be coming on at 1030 this evening. Uh, he's a main event guy. He likes to close the show anyway. So it worked out perfectly for him. Um, but anyway, so please do me a favor. Share this everywhere you can, you know, because that's how we do things. And, um, you know, we're going to roll it up for you right now. So um, I'm going to get some drilling here and uh, you guys feel free to leave some comments. Hey, Debbie. Uh, good to see you. Um, you guys want to get share this. Um, I'm, I'm updating this and sharing this out myself. Um, right now. Hope you guys had a nice day. So how you guys doing? Hope you're ready to have a good time, man. Drop a couple of comments on there. Say hello to me, for goodness sakes. Like I said, I'm just taking care of uh, sharing this out here through the groups. So give me just a second, then we're going to have a little conversation before I bring on my first guest. Uh, my first guest tonight is going to be Jason House from Meridium Sports Agency. He's one of the most respected managers in the game. And uh, he's uh, joining us tonight uh, from California. I love the guy. He's, he's good people. Uh, oops, that's wrong. I put 20, 100 hours. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Gosh, good golly. It's always a great time. Thanks, Debbie. I appreciate that. What the hell? Why can't I type today? Uh, 30. Uh. So, hope everybody's ready to have a good time tonight because I'm ready to have a whole bunch of fun and Get this show started here. So, first of all, like I said, we are talking about UFC 249. Um, it was canceled, and that just sucks. Uh, the governor of California reached out, and that was not cool. Um, you know, he pulled the uh, governor relation with Disney, Disney card, and I'm not really happy about that. But, you know, that's the way it works, right? So, that's how it goes. So, the fight was canceled. The event was canceled. Dana White is um, going to have this going again and fight island is a real thing it's going to happen um so you know you better buckle up because it's going to be a good time uh you know and i can't wait for it to happen so um the fight island is real so get on it yo get on the island man come on down and join us so anyway, UFC 249 canceled, like I said, Disney and ESPN, you know, the partners of the UFC as far as broadcasting goes, 
Um, I guess Disney doesn't want to damage their name, and that's on them. You know, I mean, they should have known getting into business with the UFC, you know, the worldwide leader in mixed martial arts, that, you know, it's not always going to be an easy road. Uh, they should have known that Dana White is a very passionate businessman, and he's going to want to do things and get things done his way. Um, you know, this is not news to anybody out there. And if you're surprised by Dana's actions and behaviors and you weren't paying attention and you didn't do your due diligence before you made this deal to broadcast the UFC, you obviously think it's worth a lot of money because at first it was just regular deals. And then you decided to um, you decided to do the deal and, and, and purchase the exclusive rights for pay-per-view. So don't be surprised that Dana White is uh, going to try to get things done uh, however he can. That's what he does. That's why he's so good at what he does. Um, I respect Dana for trying to put on the show. You know, people are saying it's all about the money. Listen, um, it's not all about the money. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. The company wants to make money. The fighters want to make money. But it isn't just about the money. Uh, you know, they want to go to work. The Dana, you know, wants to put on fights. That's what he fucking does, man. For the last 20 plus years, that's what he's done. You know what I'm saying? So everybody's itching to go back to work. Um, I believe Dana, when he says he's committed to being the first sport to come back and put on an event, and I will support the UFC and the decisions Dana White makes 100%. You know, there's other journalists out there. We're going to talk about that later with uh, Jason, who will be joining us in about 15, 10 minutes, um, that have been very vocal about crapping on the UFC for trying to put on an event saying they're being irresponsible and selfish and it's all about the money. You know, like I said, they want to make their money just like everybody else. I want to make money, but I'm not making any money right now. Uh, I'm not working. This is my job, you know? Um, and until I get some bigger sponsors on board, um, you know, I'm doing this as a labor of love. Um, you know, I've been critical of the UFC in the past. So, you know, I have no fear of, criticizing when I feel criticism is deserved. But right now, I don't see criticism as being deserved. I see praise as being what we should be throwing at the UFC and everybody behind the scenes at the UFC that are trying to make this event happen and trying to provide the world a distraction from what we're dealing with right now. So to the UFC, you know, I'm um, giving them the big... We'll do it like this. You ready? For the UFC, I say... <laughs> big round of applause for the UFC. Yes, 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 yes. Clap your hands, show the love. Hey, Forrest, if you're watching, I um, I already shared to Forum and I already shared to the Freaks and a bunch of the other groups too. Um, but wherever you want to share it, feel free. Spread that word out there, man. Um, like I said, I praise Dana White. You know, um, this is something that, in my opinion, needs to happen. I can't wait for the island to open because when the island does open up, they're going to fly fighters out there you know, a couple of weeks ahead of their fights and they are going to uh, let them train there. Uh, they're going to fight there. And, you know, when you think about it, if these athletes and their coach and everything fly out there before they get on the plane, it'll be a private plane. They all get tested, um, temperatures checked, and they do through all the protocols um, and they get on this plane and they go to this pristine island where maybe it hasn't had any effect at all, might be the safest place for them to be. This might be the UFC home for more than just, you know, a few weeks. It might be the UFC home for the next six months. You know, international fights, domestic fighters, all will show up out there. Um, interestingly enough, the UFC has a contract with ESPN that says 42 fights, 42 events have to be, have to happen this year. We are in April, uh, January, February, March, April, we're three and a half months into the year. There's about 38 weeks left in the year. They've only done seven events so far, which means they owe the folks at ESPN 35 events in 38 weeks. And if we're not going to get to the island for another four, that leaves us 34 weeks and 35 events. So don't be surprised if we see some fight weeks where we have two events at the same weekend, uh, you know, a Friday night fight, a Saturday night fight, or a midweek fight. Um, we might just see stuff like that as the UFC tries to meet their obligation, you know, it also, like I said, it isn't just about the money. Um, while the UFC gets paid for these events, um, ESPN wants the content. Even though they're being like this right now, make no mistake, um, they want the content. Um, they want to get back to business as well. 
And I don't think this necessarily came from the folks at ESPN. Disney is the parent company, and this was a direct order from Disney. Um, Dana was forced to comply. Dana didn't want to comply. If you looked at his interviews he did yesterday, um, he said that, you know, he, he did it and how could he not do it? But you can hear the tone. You can see the body language. Um, Dana White is a man that does not being told like being told what to do. Um, so with that being said, um, you know, he told the company line, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I guess I respect Dana for what he's trying to get done. Uh, so Debbie is commenting. Uh, she just said hi to Forrest and David Van Auken. What's up there, Miss Debbie Gamble? And uh, shout out to my friend David Van Auken, father of four, and the man behind Fight Bananas. Uh, always a good show. Uh, so, howdy. See, look, I could just pop that up on the screen. From Debbie to David and Forrest. Um, it's always a great time. And uh, so, all right, so hang on a second. Uh, da, 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 da. So, um, like I said, you know, the UFC is doing the right thing as far as I'm concerned, trying to put on events. Um, and my first guest, we're going to bring him in five minutes early because he's here waiting in the studio. Um, he, he runs Iridium Sports Agency, um, and they have quite an extensive roster of super talented fighters. So uh, I've met him. I talked to him at the Performance Center. We've chatted before. I've never had him on the show. So, ladies and gentlemen, is my honor to welcome to the show for the very first time from Iridium Sports Agency, the one and only Mr. Jason House. Jason, how are you? Are you there? Hopefully, I think you got turned out the music. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Jason, can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Check, check. Hello, hello. Yep, I can hear you. All right, good. Um, yeah, I heard your music was really loud. I couldn't hear you, though. I was like, oh, my God, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I'm, trying to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to put my uh, my AirPods in. I'm trying to get that to work real quick. Hold on one second. Okay. What's going on? Well, can you hear yeah. me good now? Okay. Yeah. And I don't hear any echo. Do you hear any echo? Nope. All right, good. So let me give that uh, opening again. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show from Iridium Sports Agency. <laughs> After a minute of technical difficulty, he is yes, the man sir. himself, one of the most respected managers in the game. Every fighter I know that works with him loves him, sings his praises. Um, he's truly an advocate of the athlete and the sport. Um, everybody, please welcome Mr. Jason House. Jason, how are you? Good, man. How are you? I'm freaking outstanding today, man. I'm alive. <laughs> I got my sexy blue shirt on. My wife just said, you look so handsome. I was like, Yeah. <laughs> So it feels good, man. So, uh, and you know, that's the thing right now. We're jumping into the show and right away, you got a big smile on your face. Every time I see you, you're smiling. Um, yeah. You know, life is good, right? You got a beautiful wife. You got a great business. You work with athletes um, of the highest caliber. Sure. How can you, how can you not smile? Life is good. No complaints over here. <laughs> yeah. I, I wouldn't have any complaints if I were, I don't have any complaints now and your life is a little bit cooler than mine. I still don't have any complaints. Um, <laughs> So before we get before we jump into um, a couple of the topics, uh, especially the thing about the MMA media, um, just tell us um, for you um, how your life was like. Tell us a day in the life of Jason House, uh, fighter manager, before Corona kicked in, and then a day in the life of Jason 
once Corona kicked in? <laughs> I mean, I don't think really too much has changed from the day to day as, as far as, you know, talking to clients on the daily, keeping them up to date on the news, you know, finding out how, how they're doing, how everything's going, you know, staying in contact with matchmakers, uh, with various promotions. I think the only thing that's really changed is that I've been more home more now than I ever been. And I used to joke around and say that, that my house is the nicest hotel I stay at. And, uh, <laughs> Now, I'm, you know, this is the longest I've ever been home in my house. So that's probably the only thing that's changed with the scenery. Um, you know, it's been nice to spend a lot of time with my wife at home and you know, see my family. But outside of that, you know, I think it's business as usual. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it's like um, I'm 51 years old and I've been working since I'm 16. You know, this yeah. is the longest period of my life that I have not gone to work at a job on a regular basis since I was 15 because I didn't have a job then, you know. And it's yeah. like, Wow. I don't know how I'm surviving, but I'm surviving, figuring out things to do. It's given me the opportunity to fix some stuff on my show. It looks kind of professional yeah. now, you know, a little scroll, uh, all good stuff coming. And uh, yes. the, the goal now is to take this and turn this into 100,000 followers and then uh, start monetizing yeah. my platform. So Heck yeah, have you signed any ring announcers yet? Because I'm available. I mean, you, know. <laughs> you might be our first. <laughs> hey. I, I, you know, I've talked to different managers over the years. Brian Butler, um, who I love to death, Brian Butler and those guys in Sucker Punch. And uh, I'm always like, Brian, I need a manager. You know, I don't want to, I don't want an agent like a Hollywood agent. I need a fight manager because a fight manager can represent me the right way. So yes. I'm just throwing it out there. If you find any opportunities for me to work as a ring announcer and it doesn't interfere with my duties at Island Fights because Dean is my boss and Dean is my home. Um, yes. But if it doesn't interfere anywhere, let me know. And, you know, you just tell me what, how much I got to give you for getting the gig and I'm in, but, uh, Thank you. so, so, um, tell us a little bit about how you got into this business and, uh, why you love it so much, because you really put a lot of heart and soul into this man. Yeah. And, uh, and I see it, you know, I see it in your fighters. I see it in your work every day. Um, and like I said, it's so hard to, f I was telling Jason before we started tonight, earlier we did a test. And you guys know when I do a show, I always make a, like a picture of the person and then my logo. I couldn't find one picture of Jason by himself. Every picture on his Facebook and everywhere is him and either his wife or him and a bunch of fighters or him and his team from Meridium. I had to crop a bunch of people out and just bring <laughs> Jason in by himself. It was the most difficult picture grid I had to do because he was the only one. But um, tell us why you got into this and why it means so much to you. Why are you so passionate about it? Yeah, uh, you know, I started training at Team Oyama with Jiva Santana and Colin Oyama in in 2008, and uh, both of them, I call them like my my MMA parents. They really uh, brought me up in this sport and developed me and invested a lot of time in me, and I just fell in love with the sport. I fell in love with the training, the athletes, the coaches, the camaraderie, and uh, it really just after law school, I just kind of told my father, I was like, hey, like I really want to try my hand at this. Um, I don't want to take this law firm job offer. And my dad was like, yo, you should do this, move back home, get a job at Outback Steakhouse serving tables at night. And if it works out after two years, you, you'll do something you love. And if not, at least you'll never have to always wonder what could have been. So I really owe a lot to my pops. My pops is really a big influence. And I really owe a lot to Colin Oyama and Jiva Santana for kind of taking me under their wing. So uh, the passion, what, what drives the passion inside? What's the fire inside Jason House to be, the successful MMA manager and running with Iridium the way you do. What, where's that uh, passion come from? I think it comes from twofold. I mean, the, the first part is I, I truly believe that, that we're put on this earth to serve and give, um, you know, growing up in a, in, my, in a family where my parents raised 25 foster children. And, you know, anytime there was an open bed in the household, we would, you know, uh, look to bring, bring someone that in need that I could use this opportunity. And I just kind of like, been something that I've been raised upon by my parents growing up is always that that's I think some of the greatest feelings in life is helping others and and uh, helping them achieve their dreams and fighting is just an amazing feeling. Twenty five foster kids. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Before we say anything else, I want to say this to Mr. and Mrs. House. Oh wait, that's the wrong one. <laughs> I'm gonna give them a big round of applause, man. Yeah. yeah. There, there's not a lot of people in the world that would do that. You know, there's people yeah. that do foster. Um, how was that for you as a kid growing up, you know, with, I guess, 25 different part-time brothers and sisters? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, obviously at first when you're eight, it's a new conspiracy, right? You're, you're sharing your parents, you're sharing your toys, you're, you're sharing your space in the house. It's a, it, it takes an adjustment period. But again, like my parents really sat me down at an early age and told me that, hey, like 
we feel like this is what life's about is helping others. If you have an extra room, you have an extra bed, you should help others uh, with the things that you've been blessed with. And that kind of leads to the second part. What I was going to is, is, is the culture of our agency is great. And I love it. It motivates me every day. And that's kind of the culture that I grew up in my family. My family could take eight different people from eight different backgrounds, right? Eight children, turn them into a family and help, you know, you know, make us all as one. And I think that's what I learned at a young age. And I think that helps me to relate to so many different fires and different backgrounds is the fact that, Hey, I've, I've grown up with a family. I mean, we all came from different backgrounds and you're sitting at the table every night for dinner. You're learning so much about other people. And it just helped me to not judge, but to walk up, to walk a mile in their shoes and to see where they've come from. And it also taught me like, man, you give someone an opportunity, they can do a lot in this world. Sometimes you just need someone to believe in you. That's awesome. Do, have you, uh, of the foster kids that came through your life, have you maintained a relationship with any of these people? Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we stay in contact quite a bit. I hang out with them. I see them still. And awesome. it, it's just amazing, you know, and uh, we were part of each other's lives, right? A big part of each other's lives. We grew up together. You know, we went through so many of life's growing moments together. So uh, I, I'm very blessed to, to have that opportunity. And, uh, you know, I didn't know where my calling was going to be in this world as far as kind of serving and giving on the level that my parents did. And when this came up, I was like, this is it. This is it. This is my moment. This is what I'm supposed to do with my life. Wow. I had to wipe the tears. I was, I literally had tears in my eyes. I'm just thinking about what beautiful people your parents must be, you know, and I've never met them, yeah. but yeah. what you just told me really just hits me right in the gut because there's so many kids yeah. out there in need and uh, your parents gave, them, gave it to them. And then, you know, along the way they raised you um, and they raised you to understand that as well. So you carry yeah. on, you know, um, do you have any children now? No, not yet. I definitely foresee children in the future, but not right now. I mean, maybe now during this quarantine, right? Who knows? Right? Hey, I when the quarantine started in February, I said, man, there's going to be a lot of babies born in December. You know, I mean, um, but wow. Um, the other question is, um, can your parents adopt me and my wife and take us in? Because, you know, I mean, <laughs> right. It sounds awesome. My, my parents are are amazing. I'm, I'm truly blessed, you know, and uh it's really cool just to to keep to have them along on this journey with me. My dad really helped me start my company and really helped get me going, and uh, he's he's been a big part of that. You know, we have a running joke. I don't know if you follow uh, Jimmy Valvano very much or you know his career. Um, you know, Jimmy V. Team. Jimmy yeah. V. Yeah. But he told the story about how like his dad would say, "Hey, you're gonna make it to the final four. and he's like, "I don't know, Dad. It's pretty hard to do that. He's like, "You're gonna do it. My bags are packed." And I guess his dad never left like New York ever. Right. He always had a suitcase on the side of his bed and he'd say, Hey, my bags are packed. When you make it to the final four, I'm going to be there. And I feel like that's always been my dad, right? He's always believed in me. Hey, when you get your first champion or you get your first title, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to, when you get your first guy in the UFC, I'm going to be there for you. And uh, I'm just really lucky. Um, I, I feel like what's the purpose of the ride if you don't have so many people to experience it with. And I'm lucky that my parents are there. Yeah, man. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Jimmy V. What an inspirational character yeah, he was. I love Jimmy v. Man. Ah. I'm going to cry again, um, <laughs> but um, oh, hold on. Uh, so you have a, a pretty extensive list of clients that you now work with. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite clients you have that you work with is uh, Moreno, Brandon Moreno. That, <laughs> that kid, uh, pff, listen, when that kid first showed up, people were always looking at him a little weird. And, you know, people that yeah. in the media talk to me like this kid ain't going to go. I'm like, this kid's got that fire. There's something about this kid. And I tell you, man, now he's coming to his own stride and he is on top of the world and everybody in his division um, uh, should watch out. Uh, yes. You know, his last fight was fucking incredible. Uh, woo! How, how do you feel like, you know, having him under, you know, that you're running his career for him and take him to the right spots and seeing the evolution of him and not just as a fighter, but as a man? You know, there's so many joys in the sport, right? There's a, there's a joy in like a Ricky Simone who I've been with since his amateur career and taking him from, from the beginning to the UFC now. And that's, and that's a great joy. And there's a joy in getting someone like Brandon Moreno, who, when we got him, you know, he had been released by the UFC. We went and got him that fight in LFA, that title fight. He went and looked phenomenal. And then he went, now he's on this tear in the UFC and, it's just a joy to, to enter people's lives in different parts of their, of their journey. Right. And the funny thing is my wife loves Brandon Moreno. My wife thinks Brandon Moreno is the most amazing person in the world. And, 
you know, she always say, man, I really wish we could work with Brandon Marino. She always said to me, I'm like, oh, I don't know, babe. I think he has a manager. I don't know. And then one day Cheeto Rivera made, made the relationship for us. And she was so excited because, I mean, how can I let Brandon Marino? Like I always joke around with him, like, bro, do you have a bad day? Like, what's a bad day look like for you? Like, I, can, when you have a bad day, will you please call me and let me, I want to see you mad. I want to see you angry because throughout our whole working relationship, no matter what life has given him, he makes the most out of it. I, I know it's cliche to say that. But his personality is, is infectious and, uh, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny that you say that because I've seen him lose fights. And yeah. this dude's still smiling when it's all over. He's like, whatever, man. You know, it's like it's just part of the job. You know, I, his uh, his mood, his vibe, it's very contagious. And, yes. um, you know, I, I see this kid honestly becoming a champion one day um, if he keeps on this grind. And, you know, I'm glad that he has you in his corner. Uh, because you're not going to let him get screwed over. Um, no, you're going to get him best deals, um, and uh, you know he, he he's the guy. He's a guy that's worth it. You know. So I'm looking at your roster right now, and I'm like, you know, um, it seems like um, I'm pulling up your bantamweight roster right now. You know, Cheeto Vera, Ode Ode Osborne is another killer. Yeah. Um, Nolan Hernandez, Martin Day. I mean, you you have a lot of these guys in that weight class. Journey, Kyler, um, Hunter. Uh, Terry and where, um, yeah. you know, I love that kid. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've had him on the show, you know, a couple of years back and, uh, uh, you have, a why can't I remember his name now? Uh, middleweight. Who am I thinking of? Uh, Eric Anders, Ian Heinish, Ian Heinish. Um, yeah. you know, his story is motivational, you know, and, uh, you, you, you've helped him turn his life around. He, I mean, he's putting in the work, but again, it's the relationship that you have with other people that allow yeah. you to turn your life around. And, uh, you know, there should be a movie made about him. Yes, <laughs> there will be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now I don't want to say this to get you in trouble with your athletes, but um, and I know they're all you love them all. But is there somebody that you have a special relationship above and beyond all that you know you consider? I don't want to say favorite because <laughs> no, that's like saying you have a favorite kid and you have seven kids. You know, it's not cool. But is there somebody that you kind of have that special bond with that really means? Just a little bit more to you. I don't know if there's one that means a little bit more. I think you have a special relationship with everyone in a different way. Like I was just saying, you join their their journey in life in a different different times, different moments, and they're all special. I mean, I could tell you, I could literally tell you a special story about every single one of my guys. You know, I mean, look, I have Alex Perez over at the house right now. So, I, I, and I'll tell you this: we have literally booked every single one of Alex's fights. Alex. Wow. Alex has actually been a part of our agency. We've known him since he was in high school. That's how long he's been considered family. I mean, when I got my first apartment, Alex was the first person I called and said, hey, why don't you you know, come stay with me and come train down at Team Oyama? When I bought my first house, I said, hey, Alex, why don't you come down here and, and live in my house and, and come train at Team Oyama? I mean, so there's stories about that all the time. And, you know, this journey with Alex has been amazing, right? I mean, how many fights did he have before he got in the UFC? Then he right. gets into the UFC. Now he's on this tear. You know, he's another one that's going to compete for that, for that, getting that in that flyweight title contention. And, uh, you know, there's just so many great stories and so many great relationships that we have, you know, and he's someone I, I, I love him to death. I mean, Alex has literally been with me in my lowest moments in life, and he'll tell you that. And he's been with me at some of my highest moments. And I think that's where I'm blessed that the culture of our group is so good that we could, we have the Moreno's, we have the Alex Perez's, the Cheetos, the O'Day's, the Terry and Lairs. There's so many, I can go on and on. I'm just lucky to to be a small part of their life and to to be a part of their their journey in this this the, the rides in this sport as you know they're awesome. They're nothing, this sport puts you on the biggest roller coaster. Hell like, yeah! As much as you hate it, you love it. It's like a, it's like, a body, it's like ah, you complain about it, but you're never gonna leave it, right? You're like oh, I wouldn't do this for the world. Even the lowest lows, you're like oh, it kills. But you know what? I always tell my wife when it when I stop feeling that low, I'll walk away. When it doesn't hurt that bad. On a Saturday night, maybe I should leave. At that point, you should walk. You know, it should hurt that bad. Anything you care about in life should hurt. Amen to that. Um, is and I because I don't know every fighter on your roster, like who's who's under who. Is yeah. Kama worthy one of your guys? Yes. yes. All right, look at this comment right there, Mister Goat. <laughs> <laughs> he, he calls me the unicorn because uh, oh, that, that, it's a unicorn. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. He always uh, we joke around about it because you know the way we got into the UFC and all that stuff is, it was just amazing. You know, like we, Tom was an amazing guy and, and uh, I was really looking forward to him to take on Michael Johnson. I thought I really would have showcased what a talent comma is, you know, and I know that we're going to get our opportunity here 
but you know, I was definitely looking forward to it. He's, he's a great guy and a class act. Yeah. I had him on my show the other night. I've had him on twice. Okay. Once, once after he won his first fight in the UFC. And it was funny because um, when that fight, when he took that fight on such short notice, you know, I reached out to somebody I knew that knew him and that's Phil yeah. Rowe, um, the freshman yeah. Phil Rowe. And I asked him about the guy and then Phil told me about how talented he was and that they <laughs> trained together. So I went and looked up some video and then when the fight card came out, you know, the, the night of the fight, you know, I always make my predictions and I told everybody that he was going to win and he was going to finish the fight. And nobody believed me. Everybody was picking against him. And I was right. So I had him on the show, you know, a couple about a week later. And I was like, I just want you to know, dude, I'm probably one of the only people that picked you to win, except for your teammates and people that know you close because you're a yeah. new, new thing to everybody. But I did some research and tell your boy Phil Rowe, thank you for telling me to turn me on to you because I didn't know who he was before oh, that. Cool. That's but cool. I now know who he is. He came up there. Yeah, we talked the other night and, uh, you know, he was on the show and we were talking how excited he was for UFC 249. I had Nico Price on the other night. Um, I had Sam Alvey on the other night. You know, all these guys are excited to fight. And then, boom, uh, the governor of California calls the Disney people. The Disney people call ESPN and say, you know, blah, 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 blah. They cancel the event. Um, I'm pissed. I know um, – you're probably a little upset too for your fighters. Um, but also I, I think you're a little upset also because the way the media has been attacking the UFC and um, you put up a post yesterday about it, um, you know, telling fighters to just remember who was there for you. Um, basically when they come knocking on your door for an interview, when this is all over, because they're all going to come and knock for those interviews. And I, I was screaming the same message. And that's why I had to reach out to you today and get you on the show. Because I've been telling fighters since all this happened and in the short, you know, 48 hours or 26 hours since it happened, I told them two, two different casts and one this morning. So three, just remember, guys, you know, you, you don't have to come do my show. I'm not the biggest fish in the sea. You know, I don't have this most access. But I want you to remember when everything gets back to normal and all these reporters that talked a lot of shit about Dana White and the UFC, which means they're essentially he's talking shit about you because they're saying everybody in the UFC is selfish for wanting to go fight when this pandemic's going on. And those guys knock on your door or hit you up for an email uh, for a, an interview. Tell them you get back to them, look up who they are, and then find out. And anybody who shit on all this happening, tell them to go fuck themselves. Um, and, you know, because that's how I feel. You know, I work in the media and I'm grateful for the UFC. I'm grateful for MMA. So at the time now where they're here at a low spot and they want to try to give us all a little brightness in our life and something to look at, some sports. And it's not just about the money, although if they want to make their money. There's no doubt, but so do the fighters. But at the end of the day, I think there's more to it than that um, from where I'm sitting. And so I support Dana White and I support the athletes and to all the other media members. And, you know, I don't care who they are, how long they've been doing it. I got this for them because, okay. I mean, they're wrong. And then they're going to come begging back to go, hey, Jason, let me talk to uh, Kama Worthy, even though I shit on the UFC 249 and cost him a paycheck, you know, and cost him an opportunity. Because, you know, or, you know, was part of it, you know, and I, I just don't like that. That's so hypocritical and two-faced and they're going to want to talk to all these fighters, but they don't want to support them today. And that makes me mad. And I know you have something you want to say about that. Yeah, I think, I think we're, I understand, you know, the point of journalism is, is to offer opinions and sometimes those opinions are going to, you know, be a dissenting opinion, right? Or be an opinion, you know, maybe not so highly of you or against some of the decisions that are made in business or in sports. Um, I think the issues that I'm having is just that we're, we, you know, none of them knew the, the protocols the UFC was going to put in place. None of them knew, you know, any of the, you know, preventative measures the UFC was, was, was taking. No one knew anything. So who are we to talk about what was going to happen if we don't know what was going to happen, right? It was a trailblazing moment by a company trying to see if they can put on a, a, an event safely, which I believe they could. The measures they were telling me they were taking and the testing and everything, I, I, I felt very comfortable, you know, with our fighters competing um, next Saturday night with all the measures they were taking. And I know Tachi Palace and the tribe very well, and I knew the measures they were taking as well with their staff. So I felt very comfortable with this. So to read these people judging something they don't have knowledge of, it's just like, hey, guys, I understand part of journalism is giving your opinion, but how about we wait? to see how it goes and then give your opinion because you're, you're people in this world that are trying to trailblaze and find a way to stay safe and yet still conduct business and help our economy. And so that's where my, you know, my frustration comes from. I'm not here to sit there and say, you can never say anything bad about the UFC. You can never say anything bad about me. If I do a poor job, you can say, you can write a whole article about it. I'm okay with that, but at least gather all the facts 
to say that. You know, this one article, I think it's Brian Draper, New York Times, he said that the closest hospital, uh, the nearest hospital Tashi Palace was 40 miles away. That wasn't true. It was 10 miles. He said that Tashi Palace had never done an event that wasn't commissioned by the, uh, by the California State Athletic Commission, which wasn't true. Uh, Tashi Palace had self-commissioned their shows for years. And uh, we made a statement. WEC did all their shows out there for the longest time. What's this guy talking about? Exactly. And then, then he said that um, the ABC was uh, was not given their blessing to the UFC, which we found was true, right? They, they came back and gave another statement saying that. He didn't update his article. you know. And then he, ma then he made a statement, well, I reached out to the UFC and they don't want to correct any of my errors, so that, that's kind of on them. It's like, well, it's not our job. It's, it's not the UFC's job to respond to you. They don't have to give you an interview. They don't have to respond to you. They don't have to correct any errors. You put out incorrect information. And you then when you when we tweeted you and said, hey, this is wrong, you still didn't make any, you know, edits to your article or anything. And that's where the frustration comes from is that people are so quick to give an opinion and judge. And I just feel like as a as a society, as a as 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 a human being, we should be supportive of people. I may not support you and everything you do, Chris, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna withhold judgment. I'm who am I to point finger? I don't know what's going on. You know, I don't know everything. But I just feel like the negativity that comes with this is just sad. And I think sometimes we should just hold out. I can understand their concerns. 100% understand your concerns of COVID and everything that's sure. going on. I don't take this virus lightly. However, if we don't have all the facts, how can we completely judge someone? Correct. You know, and, and here's the thing. You know, I work in the media. I've been critical of Dana White before and the UFC for some of the things that I felt needed to be criticized about. Um, none of us are perfect. We all do our thing. But in times like this, this is when, you know, those of us that have been blessed to be, you know, part of this um, for a long time need to band together, not, you know, pull each other apart, you know, and, and it, it's sad. We all benefit from this ecosystem of MMA, this, yep. this, this sport and this business. And it's just sad that we're not, you know, pulling together. Just maybe just withhold that. Say, hey, I have my doubts. I wonder how they're going to do this. That's OK. We're sitting there saying this is you know, horrible. This is this. This is that. You know, you don't know the measures they're taking. You don't know the people they've spoken to. You don't know. You know, I, I just want to believe to, to be not quick to judge. That's never been my thing, right? To each their own, I feel like. And and I just very sad in that people that I have a lot of respect for were so critical of these people. And listen, the fighters want to fight. So when you are tarnishing the UFC and UFC 249 and, and Dana White, you're also tarnishing my guys that want to fight. Correct. That's well, my, my You know, I have said that, like, hey, these guys are critiquing the event, but then they want to interview with me. I feel kind of weird about doing that. And I don't blame them. It is it is an awkward situation, right? Yep. So, yep. I mean, it's not something that I'm trying to be negative or put other people down. It's just just disheartening to me, like, hey, like, if you, if you stood to benefit from that event by you covering it, by you getting, you know, paid to do that, how can you be, you know, will you, how could you be negative about that event occurring? You know, I, I offered you media passes, you would have gone, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and if it was on pay-per-view, they all these bastards would have watched, um, you know, there's a, after we talked this afternoon when we did a test video, you know, another article came across my uh, page and uh, by a guy named Ryan Sprague, Sprague um, and says, do not praise Dana White for his failed attempt at UFC 249. Now, I just saw the headline. I was like, I already know what this is going to be, so I don't have to read it. Um, and, and these are the kinds of things that I just go, you know, look, man, first of all, when it comes to the UFC and Dana White, let's all just be real here. Um, Dana White holds grudges. Um, there's yeah. no lie. And we, and you know, Tashi Palace is going to get a huge pay-per-view event possibly too, because they stood in Dana's corner. Um, but if, if you really come after the UFC and, you know, it may not be the right way. It may not be the, the good way. It may not be the Christian way, but if, if you mess with Dana, he's going to remember. You know, I mean, ask Loretta Hunt. You know, he didn't like how she recovered, um, so he, he banned her from events. Ari, even Ariel Hawani, you know, they yeah. did not like Ariel Hawani. So when they started to deal with ESPN and then they announced that uh, Ariel Hawani was going to lead it, I pictured Dana in his office going, you know. He doesn't ask a lot of people either. It's not saying don't you can't write something that, you know, whatever, but don't shit on it when he's trying to do something good. Like you said, they tried to trailblaze something. And isn't the UFC famous for trailblazing in the first place? Why should they be any different today than they were 25 years ago when they went on this journey? Yeah, I agree. And I don't, I feel like, you know, Dan and the UFC has always been great and fair with us. They've actually taken great care of, of 
our agency and our athletes. And I don't like when people say, you know, like, I know you say he holds grudges, but I mean, is, is that wrong? I mean, if someone came and said some negative stuff about me, I wouldn't be wanting to give him interviews or have a right. deal with him either. So I think sometimes, say, oh, Dana holds grudges. And it's kind of like, man, I mean, would you would it be different if I was in his shoes and people were saying this stuff about me and all you're trying to do is build a business? And again, you don't know the intricacies of that business. Right. And yet we're sitting here writing these articles. And I just feel like, you know, sometimes I think people need to just understand, like, man, that being on social media and, and, and saying these bad things about people, it's in a get to them now in this day and age, right? Yeah. So new travels fast, especially in the social media and, and, and the internet day and age. And you can't be mad when Dana White doesn't want to give you coverage or doesn't want to work with you when you're constantly speaking poorly of him. I mean, it's not like a rocket scientist to figure that out, right? It's common right. sense. Yeah, and when I, when I say he holds grudges, I don't say there's a bad thing because, listen, if you, if you talk shit about me and try to besmirch my character, my reputation unjustly, um, yeah, I'm not going to be kind to you. I'm not going to give you something. You know, if you come to me, hey, put, you know, I've had, you know, managers at the lower level, you know, treat me like crap. And then they want me to interview their fighters. I tell them no. And they're yeah. like, why not? It's and I'm like, because you're a jerk. You know, you treated me this way. And I remember things and you know, it sucks that I'm not going to talk to your fighter, but I will when he moves on to a better management company, you know? And, and uh, you know, I just tell him straight up because look, I'm here to, you know, get, you know, give access to a fighter, give them a platform. And again, you know, I'm not ESPN. I'm not MMA junkie, but I work hard. I try to treat every fighter I talk to with respect. Uh, everybody in the business with respect and give them a platform. To me, I'm like I'm like a springboard, you know, where they can learn a little interview skill, how to answer questions, and then when they get to the bigger level, that's not such a overwhelming shock. Um, one day, maybe I'll be up there already. You know, I'll start them down here, and then I'll meet them up at the big show. Um, but but it's important to me to you know have that. But again, if you crap on me, you know that's how I feel. Um, and I even you. Um, with the great upbringing you've had, um, you know, it's, uh, I could still see like, if, you know, somebody took a crap all over Iridium and all your athletes, and then they want to come at you and ask you, Hey, can I talk to, uh, Eric Anders? You're gonna be like, Hey, listen, uh, no, you know, because you're a human being. And, you know, uh, I think sometimes people forget that people in high places like Dana White and some other celebrities and athletes have feelings and emotions, just like the rest of us. Um, you know, people are very critical of John Jones. I'm not critical of John Jones. I don't live in his shoes. I don't know what he goes through every day. Um, I love John Jones and I hope he gets, you know, whatever he needs to deal with up here and in here gets exactly. together, you know? Um, and if he never fights again, I don't care if he gets his life together and can be with his family and be there for his daughters. That's what means more to me. Yeah. I, I just think people get too comfortable disrespecting other people these days through social media outlets, through Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And that's what bothers me. You know, the one thing I will say is, like I said, Dana, Hunter, Sean, Mick have all reached out to me during this time period in the UFC to, to ensure that our athletes are okay and doing good. They always have reached out to make sure athletes are doing good. They've always taken care of us in times of need. Um, and that's the truth. And I, my thing is, if you're going to critique them to death, you might you need to give them praise too when praise is deserved. And I, that's what bothers me. I feel like there's no good pieces. If Dana, Sean, Mick, and Hunter did a, an amazing event, there's no article saying, great job to them, right? But the minute something goes wrong, you're you're sitting there finger pointing, doing this and that. And from one business owner, and my business is nowhere near the size of the UFC, I, can, I, I only can imagine the, the fires they put out on a daily basis. Um, like I said, I'm forever grateful to them, to Dana, to Mick, Sean, Hunter, and, you know, different Tita's and everyone that wasn't been involved. Yeah. Without them, I would not be in a position to have a career doing this, and neither would our athletes. And I'm not saying they're, you know, anyone's perfect. I'm not trying to, you know, I just believe that we all need to uh, take a little more compassionate look at the situation for, for what it is that people are trying to provide for their families. Yeah. If, if we were in the same room right now doing this interview in my studio, I would stand up and hug you right now. Uh, <laughs> be, be, because, you know, you know, listen, um, I, I'm fortunate enough to, you know, have met and meet and talk to and, and see some really great people in the sport. I also met a couple of jerks. But, you know, somebody like you who has that in his heart um, and you, you speak from your heart. You're not just speaking from your intellect. It's from your heart. You can hear it in your talk, the way you speak. And uh, that hits me right in the feels, as the kids say, right in the feels, yo. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hope we get more people like you involved in this sport as it continues to evolve, you know, um, because uh, you're the kind of people the sport needs. Um, so, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm kissing your butt a little bit because 
you know, people go, oh, he's kissing butt. It's, I'm not kissing your butt. I'm praising you because you've earned that praise in my eyes. Um, now, I want, I'm going to end with this, but you could we have two minutes before I bring in my next guest. Um, so Dana White, Fight Island, it's happening in a month. Um, I think, in my opinion, if this goes the right way and they take all the safety measures of flying people out there, decontaminating yeah. them, you know, uh, before they get on the plane, because there'll be a private plane flying them out. So decontaminate them all before they get on the plane. Um, when they get there, have a uh, like a, a pop-up hazmat tent. They get off the plane. They get, you know, sprayed down, whatever. Temperatures taken. COVID test if they're available. And then if they're on an island where this hasn't affected anything at all, this might be the safest place for them all to be. Training out there, you know, two weeks ahead of their fights and then fighting, you know, and then hanging out for a week, you know, just to uh, make sure they're all good before they come back to their home in the States or another country. I'm all in. I, I also said they should have done fights on a boat. Just <laughs> rent, rent, out, rent out a cruise ship, take it out to international waters. All the infrastructure's there. They have a hospital on the boat, yeah. facilities. You know, they house 2,000, 3,000 people on these big boats. They can easily put, you know, 30 fighters, 20 coaches, 50 members of the media and keep you all separated till it's time to fight. So, uh, but what's your thoughts? Fight Island, um, you know, Dana said it's going on. Are you all in on that one? I think, be, I think it would be an amazing experience. I, I would love the opportunity to go there and to watch our guys compete. And you uh, will, you'll like be I, there. Like I said, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I love the innovation and the trailblazing that they're doing. I think that's awesome, and and I think that's how you the world grows, right? Is by the trailblazers of this world that come out and, and aren't afraid to take a stab at something, and even if it fails, um, you know, that's. That's what's up, you know, and uh, I'm forever grateful and thankful to, to everything. So, yeah. and you know, I know you'll be there because if you're fighting at an event, Jason House is there. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't for the world. It's like, it's, I, 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 I'm gonna tell you right now, Saturday night is like Christmas for me. You could ask my wife, she, she could just see, like, I, I love this so much. I think this is the greatest sport on earth. And I, I wouldn't trade a low or a high for the world. I, I take it all and, and, um, you know, there's so many, even the opponents we face and some of the management groups that uh, we theoretically compete against. That I, I love it all. I think yeah. they're all great. And, um, you know, I come from a place of, um, of love. You know, I come from a place of, of respect for all of them. I think you can always learn from others. And I think there's enough food on the table for everyone to eat. I truly believe that. And, uh, you know, I'm, gr I'm grateful. I love it. Uh, I, you know, and uh, you can hear it in your voice when you talk about it. You can't, you can't hide behind the eyes. You know, whatever is real comes out of your eyes, not your mouth. That's everybody. So your eyes tell the story more than your mouth. Um, Jason, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, any last thoughts you want to tell anybody, you know, how to follow Iridium or um, follow you if they want to keep up? Because you always, you know, have, you always our, have a positive vibe to talk about. So, you know, uh, our, boost, boost our, your social media a little. Hell yeah. Our, our company, our company Instagram is uh, Iridium Sports Agency, uh, at Iridium Sports Agency. Uh, you know, we're always posting up updates on our clients and stuff. Uh, my Instagram is Jason K House. And uh, I'm just thankful for the time, Chris. I really appreciate you, brother. Hey, listen, uh, we'll talk again soon. Um, and uh, I want to set up. You got to get me Brandon Moreno. I got to talk to that kid. I, I need I need his good spirit to come through. Sure. Like so we'll set that up uh, here in the near future. Um, God bless you. And uh, I know your parents don't know me, but please, when you talk to them, say, hey, listen, this crazy MMA guy, you know, from Florida. He just wanted me to tell you how much he loves you for what you did with the other kids. They're retired now. I'm bringing them to events. One of these events, we're going to link up and have a drink together, okay? Absolutely. Well, I don't drink, but I'll have a I'll have one of these with you. Okay, perfect. Sounds hey, listen, good. man, all the love. Thank you for what you do for the sport, and uh, thanks for sending some fighters to us in Pensacola at Island Fights, man. I love Sherrard Blackledge. He's a beast. Oh, <laughs> I call him Team All Violence, baby. <laughs> yeah, I love him. Well, listen, you be good. Enjoy the rest of your Friday night. Uh, if you're celebrating the Easter holiday, it's Good Friday. Um, you know, God bless you and your family. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. All right. Peace. Oh, man, guys, that was Jason House. And uh, what a cool guy. It's the first time I got to interview him. And we are going to move right along. Um, Forrest, I'm sorry. I didn't get to see that question until just now. I didn't have my chat window up. I apologize. I will text him and, uh, after the show's over, and I will ask him your question. But right now, joining us on the show, I've got another guy coming your way. And um, this guy, he's a lightweight He's a badass. He gets shit done. He's still training right now um, amidst the coronavirus pandemic. And um, 
he made his way to the UFC through the contender series and a lot of hard work before he even got to the contender series. Um, he's a beast. Um, we've had him on the show before. He's a lot of fun to talk with. Uh, boys and girls, please welcome to Cage Side tonight, the man himself, Mr. Joe Selecki. What's up, Joe? Oh, uh, nothing, man. How's it going, Chris? Thanks for having me on, man. Oh, thanks for being here tonight, man. Um, it's going good, man. You know, I, I got a good life. You know, I got my wife out there. She's working right now, so she's paying the bills. Um, this is the longest I haven't worked in my whole life, like wow. not actual job work, so it's really weird. But I'm kind of getting used to being a kept man right now. You know, I, yeah. think I, I live that life for uh, – <laughs> I've been fighting for five years. I've lived that life for four and a half of them. <laughs> hey. You know how the regional scene and uh, it's not a valid career, you know, a viable career. Nope. So, uh, yeah, this is the first time where – I'm able to actually pull my weight in probably five years. So <laughs> well, that's awesome, man. You know, and I, I, you know, I've always taken care of everything in my house and my family. Um, but there's the first time in my life that I can't. Um, so, you know, luckily my wife, you know, my wife and I are, are the perfect couple together. We're perfect partners in this relationship. And uh, I'm blessed to have that lady by my side every single day. And I never, ever take her for granted. And I never, ever forget how blessed I am, you know, because uh, I'll tell you real quick, we met, 20 years ago and we dated 20 wow. years ago basically it was a you know couple month fling where we just like to get a little freaky deaky and then you know <laughs> she, she went her way and i went my way and we would see each other periodically in town you know years go by we'd see each other and the vibe was always there and then uh about seven years ago she uh reached out to me of all places uh, on my cage star with christopher james facebook show page and uh huh. she, she messaged me and she's like i've been seeing you while what's going on and we start chatting and she said she was uh, living down Fort Myers, uh, which is about two hours away. I got in the car as soon as we finished chatting. I went down there. Um, we hung out all night, and we've been together ever since. You wow. Know, it's, it's, it's really crazy how, you know, I always knew that there was something cool with us, but I had no idea she was going to be my wife one day. And, uh, you know, the, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And uh, that's a fact. He, he put us <laughs> together. You know, he put us together when we needed him to. Um, because I think, you know, had we tried it earlier in life, uh, probably wouldn't happen. Hi, guys. Welcome to Relationship Issues with Christopher <laughs> James and Joe Selecki. No, that's amazing. That's all, that's all yeah. I love hearing stories like that, man. That's I, amazing. Yeah. It, it's really a beautiful story. Uh, how did you and your girl meet? Uh, so it's funny because when you were, I was just catching the end of your uh, your segment with Jason, and you said that guy's right, awesome, by the way. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I've seen a lot of like what he's been posting and stuff. And uh, because of Andrew Ferry and the fight game that I was sure. involved with. He's been filming a lot of Jason's clients, and he's been sharing a lot of his stuff. And uh, I was talking about him yesterday, actually, to a guy I trained with, and he's like, "Oh, I've always heard great things about." Him. I was like, "Oh, same here. He seems like a great guy." But you're saying you don't drink? I don't drink. And I was okay. training somewhere, uh, and my coach was friends with the guy that owned the bar, so I would go. I was friends with my coach at the time, and uh, we would go to the bar all the time. My wife was the bartender, so I was eating salad and drinking water at the bar like three nights a week, four nights a week, and. Uh, the only one that wasn't, you know, a bumbling drunk idiot for her to talk to. So <laughs> it took like three or four months of me staring at her and showing up every night for her to realize I didn't really care about the salad and spending my money I didn't have on the food there, you know. And uh, same thing. I think we went on one of the longest first dates in history and uh, been together ever since. I'll be, it'll be five years in uh, five years in August. Yeah. Is that her, is that her in the background coaching? Yeah. You? Yeah. No. I like. I don't know the answer. So. To these things. So. Um, <laughs> Ask her to come onto the video with you. Tell her to come over here for a minute. Yeah. Oh, gosh. oh, you're fine. We don't care, man. It's pandemic. <laughs> you're allowed to look however you want. Hi, Hi sweetie. How are you? What's your name? Good. How are you? What's your name? Casey. Casey. All right, let me ask you a question. Uh -oh. He said it was the longest first date ever. He would come into the bar, wasn't worried about the salary or anything. And he said he was staring at you. Was there ever a creeper vibe that you got off him? <laughs> Not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. But after after a little while, he started to scare some of my customers away. Yeah. He got once he was like emotionally invested, he would uh, he'd just like stare at my customers down the bar. I'm like, honey, you can't. Like, they're paying me. <laughs> I'm making money from this. He's like, like you gotta go if you're gonna look at people like that. <laughs> Joe, man, so sweet. Joe, you can't scare the people out of there, bro. Yeah, I had to learn. It took me especially, a while. Especially especially because she was paying the bills, dog. Yeah, that's a fact. That's a fact. Oh, boy. He finally learned, though, right? Yes. He's, he's all, all right. right. All right, he's all right. He's, he's, he's getting better. So before you go away, I'm going to ask you one more question. Um, you've been invested in Joe now for five years. Um, yeah. not, and I don't mean financially. I just mean in, in life. Um, a little yeah. bit financially, I guess. But... 
Um, what did it mean to you? Not the night he got the contract at the uh, Contender Series, but the first night he went to the UFC and he got his first UFC win. Oh, my God. What was going on in your heart and your head that night? Oh, so much. Like, everybody saw my reaction at the Contender Series. It was no it was no surprise that I was just like this wave of relief came over me. When he won his fight at the UFC, I literally just kind of sat down on the bleachers and, like, burst out in, like, laughter. Like, I was just like, <laughs> oh, my God. This is crazy right now. This is insane. It was easily it was just it felt so normal you know what i mean like it felt so right like you know it, it was just it was everything was the way it was supposed to be this is always what was supposed to happen and watching it happen was just nuts it was i it, i have no words it was insane i literally <laughs> sat down and just started laughing like I, I'm, well, I'm thinking i'm thinking to myself what she said go why are you laughing like i can't believe you really is here or i mean what's yeah. going on you know <laughs> Or, or is, is the laughter going, I can't believe the guy that was creepy in the bar is now my husband <laughs> for the UFC. I mean, <laughs> you know, um, the, even though Joe gave me the quick condensed version of your, your guy's love story, um, I don't know if you heard me telling my love story about my wife. That's amazing. Like like Joe, I love stories like that. You know, I was, I'm, you guys watch, uh, there's a show, uh, Chicago Fire, Chicago Med. No, I've been right. really good things. Well, today, I, I've been investing in that show since episode one, and today I was watching the episode that was on Wednesday on my DVR, and one of the characters was getting married, man. I'm sitting there, and the wedding starts, and I'm, <laughs> I, I start crying like a little girl. <laughs> That's awesome. I, 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 I everything. I, I, I'm such a wuss. I, like, That's her. I, I, I cry over everything. everything. The wife and I will be watching like American Idol or something, you know, and, and somebody gets through and I'll look over at her. She's on the couch and I'm like, I'm not fucking crying, yo. You are. I'm like, I'm like, he has, that's awesome. He has like a standing joke going on his Instagram. Every time I start crying, he yeah. records it and puts it on his Instagram yeah. stories. And now all these people are just like, oh my God, Hundreds. has she cried yet today? Hundreds <laughs> of people reach out and just like laugh at it. It's, yeah, a, whole, so, it's a whole uh, thing now. Sometimes I try to keep my manhood in, intact, you know, and like <laughs> when the tears start coming, I'll fake a sneeze. I'll be like, oh. yeah. <laughs> you got to hide it. Yep. Uh, uh, we've all my, wife, my, my wife don't buy it, though. She knows who I am. Um, <laughs> but even fake love on a TV show hits me in the yeah. heart. Um, oh, so, it gets me every time. Because I love love. So that's, that's just awesome. it, you know. Um, and I love that you guys have an awesome story. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, oh, you got to give him a smooch now. Oh, no. Oh wait, and and now because Joe was already on the show before, but you were so before you go. Yep, there's something I make every first time guest uh, on the show do. You gotta sing. She can sing good. Oh, I can sing. Well, sing us something. Sing. Whatever you want. Just give us a little song. Oh gosh. Uh. Quick, quick, quick. Uh, uh, oh God, I'm under pressure. I don't know. Under pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately, all I'm thinking is Whitney Houston right now. Sing and it. I... <laughs> That's all I've got. You know, That's it. We'll always love you. Ooh, I... That's all I got. <laughs> that was awesome. She hits him. Are you okay? I'm no, no, you can do it. I think we should get we should get you on American Idol next year or The Voice. I tried. I tried twice. Did you really? Yeah. For Idol or The Voice? Idol. All right. Fuck they don't know anything. talent anymore. They don't know talent. Let's take okay. you to The Voice. They don't know nothing. And we'll get you on The Voice and, you know, then uh, what does face will be going like this? Like, Pick, me. Pick me. Pick me. He's hysterical. I'm, I'm sad that Adam Adam uh, Levine is gone. Yeah. Who replaced him? Um, A Jonas brother. Ew. Yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, Thanks. why not just bring in Vanilla Ice? Yeah, <laughs> that'd be way more entertaining. People would turn tune in for that. All right, well, listen, Miss Casey, uh, thank Have you so fun. much for your time. Thanks for sharing a little story and Thanks a little talk with us. Oh, anytime. Anytime I have a mod, you're more than welcome to come steal this. <laughs> He's like, no, please don't. <laughs> He's sitting there right now going, all right, man, this is my interview, man. Yeah. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye, sweetie. <laughs> Uh, your wife's awesome, like my wife, man. Yeah, she's fantastic. We're we're blessed, man. And she can sing. But uh, yeah. next time we get her on the show, we'll have her prepare a song ahead of time. Yeah. 
And then we'll have very indecisive. So she'll need time to think about it. (laughs) Oh man. So, all right. So coronavirus has hit the pandemic is running the world. Um, Tell me a day in the life of Joe Selecki prior to Corona. um, And then a day in the life after Corona started. It's it's not terribly different. The only difference is now I get to be home because, uh, for me, like I was saying, you know, I always say when I'm doing my camps, like my camp's all over the place. So I'm based out of Wilmington, North Carolina. And then our MMA team, you know, we do our jiu-jitsu here. And I have John Salter here as my coach. Um, but we're a jiu-jitsu gym, you know. So we drill our striking on our own time, just a couple of us. And then, you know, our wrestling and all that. And we spar. But we do our MMA. We get our MMA coaching from Jeff Jimmo at Jim O in Charlotte. So up there, we got a bunch of guys. Um which is four hours away from here, you know. So we have uh, Scott Holtzman trains there, Brian Barbarina, uh, Impa Kasaganai, who everybody saw in the contender series. I, I, I wish I wish you were around Scott um, when he used to have the guys come out on the regional scene in the hot sauce suits. Yes, I've seen pictures. I've heard I, stories and I, seen pictures. I announced his fights at the XFC before he made it to okay. the UFC, and uh, those guys would come out and they would rock the crowd, all the red morph That's suits. Awesome. It was so yeah. cool, dude. He, he's such yeah, a good sure. dude, him and his family. But anyway, um, I, I had to, I had to throw that out there before I forgot. You know, you got yeah. Impa, you got Impa with you and uh, Coach Gamble, you guys and uh, Ricky Rainey, and there's so many guys. Like Ricky came through the XFC. There's so many guys I have experience with. Yeah, and, yeah. And I'm glad that you're learning from some of these guys because uh, they they know what it takes to get there because they had to work to get there as well. So for you, a younger fighter, that's such a benefit. Yeah, and and having you know. All that experience in one room, all of that, you know, iron sharpens iron, the old cliche, but it's true. And then having Jeff Jimmo there is huge because it's somebody that is, I mean, I think time is really going to prove because being a full-time coach maybe hasn't been, he hasn't been coaching everybody full-time for more than a couple of years now, Right. but he's always been coaching people behind the scenes, you know, for years and years and years. And I think the next four or five years are really going to be telling when all of a sudden people are going to be like, I see that guy in every... You know, every other fight, I'm seeing that guy in the top guy's corner, and that's going to be Jeff Jimmo because he's on that level of head coach. Uh, he's a genius, you know. Yeah. So having him there has been phenomenal too. And then uh, also a day and a half, two days a week, I go and stay in Myrtle Beach, which is an hour and a half from here where I used to live and train so that I can train with my boxing coach, Chris Gowd, and a couple of the teammates there that are a little more my size that we don't have in Wilmington. So um, I'm all over the place when we're not having this go on. The only thing that's changed now is all my training is at Salty Dog Jiu-Jitsu right now with John Salter and a few guys that are able to train with us. We're closed, you know, to the public and to our members, but we're able to get our work in, you know, when we can. And then uh, I'm able to do my strength and conditioning still with my coach, whether he has to send me workouts or I have to meet him somewhere. Uh, Hudson Rose has been awesome with that. And uh, then on my free time, you know, if I we're only, you know, getting to the gym maybe once a day and doing our two sessions crammed into one. Right. So a little less rest. That just gives me more time to work on something at home, you know, so cardio or maybe I'm doing um, some lactic workout, lactic workouts, uh, every minute on the minute type stuff. Um, so if anything, I'm getting a little extra conditioning in than I normally would. So it's been good, uh, you know, getting to spend more time at home, which which is very rare for me because I'm always either in camp or somebody else is in camp and I'm traveling. <laughs> so this has actually been kind of nice, you know, but the fact that they're not having fights now, that's always scary for all of us because we don't know when it's going to happen again. So Four uh, weeks, dude. Just clear Four that weeks. Up, it'd be great. Four weeks. Five at the yeah. most. Fight Island is going to happen. Um, so, you know, Dana said it. I believe Dana. Um, he's yeah. going to make sure you guys all get your fights in that you're supposed to get. Um, there's probably going to be weeks because, you know, the UFC was contracted for 42 events with the ESPN. Yeah. Um, three, 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 yeah. Two weeks, you know. Uh, to a day, we might have a you know a day night yeah. event, you know, double header, uh, double header because it's all going to happen on the island. So uh, I and I don't know where the island is. I don't know what infrastructure is already in place. Dana is, and now that all this has happened, Dana is not going to divulge a word. Yep, and he should. You, you guys the are thing. they're going to show up at your house. Me and uh, Nico, me and Sam Alvey and uh, Kama Worthy, we're talking about this the other night on the show because um, they were supposed to fight on two forty nine, which got canceled. Um, and I was like, you know, we we're talking about Dana coming to you know, do this. And they're like, I feel Sam Alvey says, he goes, I feel like they're going to show up at my house and just put a hood over my thing and throw me in the back <laughs> of a fucking black van. And yeah. I said, would you go? He goes, yeah, I'd go. Yep. Fuck it. I want to yep. fight. So, <laughs> so I don't think it'll go that far, but I think they're going to probably, you know, fly you guys out on private jets um, to get out there. They're not going to tell you where it is. Yep. Um, 
And once you get there, they're going to tell you, you know, post from the island, you know, but don't tell people where the island is, you know, show exactly, pictures yeah. of everything. And that'll be good. Um, and I also think I was talking with Jason House at the end of the interview. It might be the safest place to do fights right now. I think because, you're right. Yeah, I was listening to that. Because I, I think if they fly you out there and, you know, before you get on the plane, um, you know, I'm guessing for fighters in the States, they might bring everybody to Vegas or, you know, to New York or to a city you could fly out of a big city with their big jet, get everybody there and then fly out on a UFC jet to the uh, to the location um, and have everybody get decontaminated before they get on the plane, um, have testing ready as soon as you get off the plane. Um, they can have a clean room like they do at a at a, at a hazmat site, you know, where they have a clean yeah, room, yeah. you know, and shower you guys down with disinfectant and, you know, everybody. And that means anybody who's going to be in the building for the fight has to be the good media, um, which I hope he doesn't invite any except for guys like me who are cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm not on the invite list because I'm not in the big media, but um, but I'm loyal to what they're yeah, doing. Exactly. So, that's, but, that's that's a whole other issue, man. Yeah, yeah we were talking about that. But but they decontaminate everybody, stay on top of you, have doctors there, um, and you know, bring you out there two weeks before your fights so you can train and get used to the w- environment you're in. And I think it might end up being the safest place to do fights right now. No fans in attendance. So the only people that are going to be there are going to be cleared medically um, through the UFC and their medical partners. I think it's an outstanding idea. And uh, if ESPN doesn't want to broadcast it, I'm pretty sure that Dana can still broadcast it on Fight Pass. Yep. Um, I think. You know, yeah. there's a lot of contractual stuff there. But if he can, you know, just he'll call them all prelim fights. All because he can put all yeah, kinds there of you go. And, everything's and then, a prelim, even a title fight, prelim title fight. <laughs> I hope that with the respect that he showed them of backing down when he didn't have to, they'll show that same courtesy and let him stream on ESPN. But if they don't, I think you're right. As he said, he had the right to stream on Fight Pass. So either way, he's going to get this off. And uh, that's just kind of what we have to take comfort in right now, you know. And uh, it's crazy. It's just crazy because this is a very serious thing going on. And, and I would never want to downplay that. Right. And people get, you know, you got to be careful what you say, what you do. Like, I was worried posting a picture of me hitting pads with a teammate because I was worried I'm going to get backlash for that. You know, you don't know. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day is, yes, it's dangerous, I guess. But if we're going to an island or we're going to an Indian reservation like Tashi Palace that hasn't been open for a month, and even if we had to stay there for two months, I would do that to stay and get to work, you know. And people are saying it's dangerous, but we're some of the healthiest, you know, most in shape, you know, strongest immune system people there are, you know, so. And you're already doing something don't... dangerous for a freaking living. Exactly. And here's the other thing that people don't understand is what's more dangerous, you know, getting sick or, you know, your family not, not that we're in that situation and there's a lot of fighters that aren't because once you get, you know, we're, we don't get paid like other sports, but we get paid, you know. You're, not, you're, yeah. you're, you're doing fine in other exactly. words. But it's like, you know, people, it's like people losing their businesses, you know, people are going to, if this continues too long and there's no way to, you know, work or whatever, people are going to start jumping off buildings or God knows what. So yeah. um, if we're able to work and we're able to do it safely, it's no more dangerous than going to Walmart. I don't care what anybody says because it's safer. You know, exactly. And, and if we're all tested, especially so there's no medical people that checking people at Walmart, go ahead and walk in the door, gloves, exactly. no gloves, mask, no mask, just walk in, buy our stuff and go home. Um, exactly. So I think you have more risk of exposure at Walmart or, grocery store like Publix or Target, anything. So Yeah. And, you know, the other argument that I've seen in the media is, well, you know, for the first time, independent contractors, you know, qualify for benefits and all these things. But the only thing with that is that's for people that really need it right now that are out of work. You know, we're not out of work. We're able-bodied. We're able to train a little bit. We're able to fight. So let us fight so we don't have to take somebody else's benefits that they need right now, you know. And um that's the hard part. As independent contractors, no one's holding a gun to our head making us fight. So I think it really would have been the best thing for ESPN. And I think ESPN was pumped about it because they were pumping it out on Sports Center and everywhere else. I think it really came down to Disney and, and the governor of California. California. Yeah, exactly. So it is what it is. We have to respect that. But the only thing we can do is train, stay ready, and, uh, you know, just stay positive, I guess. You know, it's, yeah. it's tough when you don't know when you're fighting. But I'm just going to train like I'm going to Fight Island in three weeks because yep. who knows? Maybe we won't. Hey. And what you just said about, you know, that independent contractors are eligible for benefits, um, but you don't want to take somebody else's benefit that really needs it when you don't. So for that, I give you this. 
Take a bow, Joe. Take a bow. Take a bow. <laughs> um, I, I just, you know, I, I love your attitude about it. You know, I love the support that I've seen from the UFC roster. Uh, Carlos Sparza came out, Sam Alvey, um, who was supposed to be on the card. So many fighters um, are backing Dana on this play. And I, I, I think it's not just because they want to fight um, per se. I think it's because they see how much Dana is putting into this and what he's had to do to get to even get 249 happen. He got a venue like he said he would. Um, yep. It was going to be sanctioned um, like he said it would. Um, all the precautions were in place like he said they were going to be. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, and the rules changed. And the rules changed every five minutes on him. I don't think he slept more than, you know, 15 to 20 hours in the last three and a half weeks. Now, he did say yesterday he's going to go to sleep for three days because he's that. fucking exhausted. And uh, yeah. you know what, Dana? You go take you a nap, boss man, and uh, we'll all be waiting for you to come back and bring in some fights, man. And uh, there's a lot of us that are in your corner. Uh, I'm one of them. So and every fighter, this is probably the first time in a long time where every single fighter seems to be on the same page, you know, except for there's a few, and that's fine, you know, and, and as independent contractors, we don't have to fight. But the thing is, is I see things like people saying, well, they should just pay you. Well, that sounds fantastic. That's not how this works. You know, we're independent contractors, and we know that when we sign up to fight and when we sign with the UFC or Bellator, you know, that's that's not part of the job. You know you don't get health insurance. You know you're not going to get a paycheck, a monthly, yearly paycheck. We are signed, you know, to fight for pay and then go home, you know. No different than if somebody's building a deck on your house. I'm not calling our electrician, seeing if he's doing all right with his bills because <laughs> he did a job for us, you know. It's yeah. the same thing, and we know that, so – when media says that, yeah, it's nice to think about, but that's not their job. They have a, they have a company to run. They have a, a $4 billion loan they have to, that Endeavor has to pay back. You know, People don't think about that, and it's not that. We want the opportunity to work because we're young and able-bodied, and we're not the people that need to stay, you know, stay home right now. So it's frustrating, and it just seemed like a lot of the media was taking a – you know, really enjoying the fact that Dana was struggling, you know, not so much the fighters, but if they're going to enjoy Dana struggling, they're enjoying us struggling because it means no fights. So, which is uh, what I've been saying and what Jason said, we're all on yeah. the same page with that. And, uh, you know, I've been echoing this since this happened yesterday because even I, I really made me think yesterday when the announcement was made that it was canceled, I started seeing tweets going, Well, it's about time, you know, and Dana being irresponsible and don't praise Dana for this. And, you know, Dana, and I got mad. So I, I started putting out a message, and I'm going to continue to say it for a long time. If you're a fighter and you fight in the UFC and a reporter calls to ask you for an interview or a written interview or an appearance on a show like this, and they want to know if you could do it before you say yes or no, go back and look up the reporter. Make sure that they supported this all the way through. And if they didn't support you all the way through this and Dana and the UFC – who they all make a living off of in some way or another, then you know what you say to them? You call them back or you send them a message. You go, you know what, man? You weren't there for us when we needed the support from the media community, so I don't want to do your show. And uh, I, I think that's what should really happen. You know what I mean? Oh, 100%. And this is funny because um, where we train, you know, we were going during the day and training. Um, before then, now we had to find a different solution somewhere else. But we're making it work. But um, there's a place, you know, we're in like an industrial park, and – there's a company there that isn't necessarily essential at all, but, uh, you know, they're, they're still open because technically they supply builders or whatever they do. And, uh, you know, the guy called the police that he saw guys with gym bags going into the gym or whatever. And our, our, the guy that owns our gym told him like, Hey, no, we just have some professionals that are coming in and they teach here, you know, they're employees. So, and I said, you know, it's not like he saw us doing something wrong or we're not, not social distancing. We're going to the gym and going back home, you know? Right. I want to go. I so badly want to go where I have a baby on the way in September when that baby's born. I want to walk up to that baby and go, Hey, remember when you were calling the cops? Like, you were taking <laughs> food off her table, you know? Yeah. And, and it's the same thing here is like, I understand that a lot of the media doesn't like Dana or he's a polarizing figure or whatever. But at the end of the day, we have family. So it's like, I mean, Luke Thomas is, is the one that's probably been the most outspoken and the most negative. Luke like, Middlebrook, Luke kids, Thomas. You know? Um, there's a lot of them. So, you yeah. Know. And, and, and the same thing is like, man, if somebody's trying to keep you from working, you know, when Ariel and Ariel's been pretty good about us, I think, but, uh, when he got his credentials ripped away, you know, everybody was outraged, but it's, that's what's happening to us right now. And they're not outraged. They're celebrating right. it. So yeah. it's frustrating, you know, and it's just a, it's a weird time. You know, everybody has different views on it, but you can't, uh, I just don't think you can 
you can't celebrate that as a win for anybody, you know, especially Correct. for how many recycled articles can people do about old fights or about coronavirus yeah. before we need a fight to write about, you know? So, um, and I just think it would have been good for people to watch right now, something to bring people's spirits up and, uh, it would have just been good to keep the ball rolling, but it, you know, it is what it is. But I think Fight Island is going to be a great thing. And now, you know, even if it wasn't going to be a thing before, it's 100 percent going to be a thing now because. But it really was going to be. It was really, as it gets. And it was really going to be a thing before him and Ari Emanuel were sitting in the office and they came with this idea. And I, I love the idea. I love the concept. Um, Like Jason House said, you know, they were trying to trailblaze to get 249 and they're going to trailblaze more with this. And isn't that what the UFC has always done even before Ari and Endeavor got involved? They've trailblazed so much. So, um, but I'm looking at the clock. Um, I got another guest standing by. Um, have you ever met Giga Jakadze? No, I haven't. I've well, uh, seen stuff about him. Yeah, great fighter. All right. So, you're both in the same division. So, before I, we, well, I'll have you say goodbye after I bring him in and introduce you guys virtually. So, ladies and gentlemen, joining us on the show, he is a UFC lightweight as well, um, Mr. Giga Chikaze. Uh, Giga, welcome to the show. Hi, hey everyone. Um, <laughs> just uh, one, one, uh, one thing. I'm not a lightweight. I'm a featherweight guy. Featherweight. They have you listed as a lightweight. See that? Oh, oh yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <I'm confused. laughs> All right. Well, because well, this is Joe Selecki. This is Giga. <laughs> That's I mean, good. We're yeah. in the same weight class. That's not awkward. Even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, he might move up. You might move down. But uh, you know, definitely not. If he comes up, one thing I. I had to cut a leg off to get to the other way. So. <laughs> We're good on that. You know, and it's cool when I do this show because there's opportunities like this where I can introduce one fighter in the UFC to another fighter. Um, and you guys all understand each other. You know what I mean? You're all, even if you have to fight each other someday down the road, not just that you guys, but other guys, you know, um, yeah. it's cool because you're all on the same journey um, trying to achieve the same thing. So, uh, and the one thing I've learned about fighters doing this is that even you know, you fight night is a fight night. You you know, you got to be here. But other than that, you're all the same and we're all part of a community and we always reach out to help somebody in our community. Uh, fighters are the best at that. So uh, I wanted to make sure I introduced you guys before since we can't hang out Thank in the same you. room, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, Joe, uh, Joe, before I let you go, I want to say thank you for taking the time again. This is the second time you've been on the show. Thank your wife, Casey, for jumping on and uh, singing with us. That was awesome. I will. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll be getting an announcement about Joe Selecki on Fight Island coming up yeah. shortly. So uh, enjoy the rest of your night, man. If you're a uh, Catholic or Christian, you're celebrating Easter and Good Friday. Uh, God bless you, man. Stay safe. Be well. And uh, I can't wait for the little baby to get here and you go, look at my little baby. Yeah. Thank you, man. I can't wait. Yeah, we are uh, we are Christians. So I really appreciate that. And have a happy Easter. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, hopefully with some good news. All right, man. Be well. God bless. And uh, have a good night. You too. Thanks, Joe. All right, guys, that was Joe Selecki signing out, and we're just going to keep this ball rolling. Um, this man right here, um, he's 9-2. and two. He's a featherweight. I thought he was a lightweight. <laughs> I'm not perfect. Um, he's in the UFC, uh, and he's he's a he's a legit badass, man. Um, he was born in uh, Georgia, not the state, the Republic, and he's now called Los Angeles home. Um, I was looking at a clip with you and Joe Rogan, and you were speaking in your native language, and he was like, what were you saying? And you were like, uh yeah go georgia or go georgia i love how you hold that <laughs> i love how you hold your country um and your culture and your roots and you never forget where you came from um a lot of guys sometimes get a little lost along the way but uh, i'm so glad that you represent all that and you uh every time you get the opportunity to praise your country that you do um absolutely absolutely christopher i am uh i was born in georgia in a capital tbilisi i grew up there and uh the one, of, the one and the only reason why I moved here in California is to get in UFC and uh, raise my flag inside the cage and let the people know that there's a country called Georgia that's not a state. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I was putting up a post about it today, I was like, uh, I got to make sure that I tell people it's the Republic of Georgia because when they hear country, you, my friend, country, we made a. It was, so it, it was the Soviet right. Union, right. and uh, uh, it, in 1990, we made it. Uh, we came out from Soviet Union, and uh, we we're an independent country for almost 30 years. Now. Yeah, and, that, and that's awesome. I'm, I'm glad you guys have that. But and I'm, like I said, I'm glad that you got to plant your flag inside the octagon. Mm -hmm. uh, that's awesome, you know. And it's, 
but I didn't want to tell people that you were from Georgia and not put Republic or country. Yeah. Then you would have come on the show and they would have expected you like to have a, a redneck accent, you know, Hey, how y'all doing? I'm from Georgia. They would have got confused. <laughs> and, and you're wearing, oh, and you're I wearing, got, I got that question so many times, you know, like <laughs> I kind of speak normal English uh, compared to my other, uh, other friends who moved here and everyone when i say like i'm from country georgia uh when i say i'm from georgia like yeah why do you have such accents <laughs> you know like <laughs> no i i'm not from the state but uh, it's yeah confusing. so um how long have you now been living here in the united states uh i live here already five years like a little over than five years what was the uh what's been the what's the thing you miss most about your home country <laughs> versus here i miss everything my friend i miss everything i miss food i miss my land i miss friends uh, family uh, atmosphere the connection we have there is a little different because i live in huntington beach right now and uh, everything is so far you need to drive and if you want to say hi to anybody and just talk <laughs> the car to go and you know stop by somewhere yeah, in my city where i grow up it's so everything together that let's say uh you you hear everything what's going on in your neighborhood you know there's right. a fight right. going on there's a, i don't know somebody singing somebody dancing always something it's a big big uh, uh fast paced city yeah it's got to be it's everything there. total culture shock i guess when you first got here right yeah, yeah, well, totally it was. Uh, actually, I, w I used to live in Holland for a long time, almost uh, eight years, uh, in a big city in Amsterdam. It was pretty busy as well, kind of similar style like my city where I grew up. And then I was, uh, then I traveled in U.S. in different states to find a place where I wanted to settle. And I was looking for the best place because I, I had uh, my daughter and my wife, so I wanted my family to be on a on a best place. And um, I traveled in Philadelphia, in New York, uh, in Washington, and finally I traveled in LA. And once I came here, it was completely different from any other state. And uh, yeah, weather is a game changer, so I decided to stay here. Yeah, you can't beat the weather in Southern California, no doubt about it. Um, so your journey to the UFC, um, you know, you've gone through a bunch of different things. Um, you know, you're one of the rare guys that fought on Dana White's Contender Series and you didn't win your fight. Um, yeah. But but you came, overcame that and you took a couple of fights right after. You got two solid wins. And boom, you get the call for the UFC. Um, again, you know, that's a rare thing because a lot of guys that go through the contender series, they lose and, you know, it seems like they don't ever get that shot again. But your will and your determination and your grit, and I think that's probably attributed to where you were raised, um, the work ethic in, in most foreign countries is, for us foreign countries, is stronger. American people sometimes are lazy and they don't they, listen. They're spoiled. They don't work as hard sometimes. Um, but where you grew up, it's it instilled in you at a young age to put in the work for anything you want. And if you work, you get. I think that this I got from my family and uh, they always taught me that if you work hard and dream bigger, you always can make the thing what you want to do. Uh, and I was just chasing my dream for a long time. Um, yeah, I, uh, I started my MMA career actually here because uh, I, I was a kickboxer uh, yeah. before I was karate fighter. Um, and uh, as I told you, the reason was uh, to raise my flag uh, in UFC. Uh, well, that's why I moved here. So I slowly started to do like baby step in MMA. <laughs> Uh, I was already the world champion in karate and kickboxing, so I had the experience in a high, high in a sports I, uh, and a big organization. So I kind of knew what I was gonna go. Uh, I knew that that would not be a, a short shortcut somehow to get in UFC. Maybe the contender series was one of the way how to get in UFC, but. Um, 
uh, it showed that my grounding, ground game in Jiu Jitsu was not enough at that moment. And uh, yeah, even I was winning the fight for 14 minutes, and yeah. the last minute I got choked. Uh, <laughs> uh, but after that, uh, I completely retired from kickboxing because at the same time I was doing two things. So I was a beginner in uh, glory kickboxing. Uh, I was getting paid from the glory and doing a MMA career starting, you know, so it, it was really hard to do the two rabbits to catch together. So I say no to kickboxing and uh, I started hard work just and to concentrate on MMA, did a lot of wrestling, a lot of Jiu Jitsu and all this uh, helped me a lot to grow fast. Yeah. And, yeah. I got a call from the ufc and finally we're here yeah and you know like you said um you you stop the kickboxing and concentrate on really learning the administ the uh stuff you need in jujitsu and grappling and ground game and you know here you are you know yeah uh, the first fight after your contender series fight um you fought a guy named cj baines and you uh got you a nice arm bar win in 12 seconds your next fight you get a, uh somebody tapped out to your punches which I always feel is awesome. You get a split decision in your debut against Brandon Davis. You get another split decision um, against Jamal Emers in your last fight at uh, Adesanya Romero. And um, watching you, um, you know, because I've watched, you know, from the Contender Series, I remember, you know, watching you kickboxing too. Uh, you're a phenomenal kickboxer, you know. It's like, wow. Thank um, you. you know? And so seeing you evolve and adapt as an athlete and picking up – the ground game, and there's still work to do, but for what you've picked up in the short amount of time, um, it just shows your natural athletic ability and your um, proclivity to be able to adapt to a different sport. So, uh, you know, the sky's the limit, you know. It's uh, going to be interesting to watch. So, And you could end up being you know, a karate world champion, a kickboxing world champion at the high levels, and you could end up being a UFC world champion. Um, I don't think anybody else has accomplished that, if I'm remembering correctly. I mean, so this could be like the awesome fight. That, that's a goal. That's a plan. That's my dream. Uh, you know, I, I fought uh, on the highest league in my, in karate and kickboxing. Yep. And uh, I got the titles, not just... Uh, I, I know that some people say, like, oh, I'm a world champion in karate and uh, or world champion in kickboxing. And... I know what shows they are talking about, you know. Right. And, um, my in my case it was different. I I, I, I devoted all my life for the these sports, and I I masterminded myself in these striking sports. And uh, now, since we are in a, such a big league uh, in UFC, if we make it, and I believe we have uh, all the ability and skills to make it, and I'm still getting better and better every day, so that will be something special, some special moment, I believe. So it's going to take a little time. I'm not rushing at all. Um, yeah, I have uh, two fights to win. Uh, I was going to fight even this month. Probably you don't know about this, but uh, I was going uh, to get a fight, like quick notice fight against the first. First was a Karma Worthy. Uh, Karma Worthy. Guy. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, he was in a show. I checked your website. Yeah, he was on yeah. a show the other day, and uh, I just had his manager on the show tonight, Jason House. Yeah, I know Jason well. I know. He's a good man. Um, he's a very good man, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, they offered me the karma worthy for short notice fight uh, in lightweight, and I said yes. But uh, somehow it didn't work it out. I I don't know the final um, why why the, there was no contract. Of course, the Dana canceled yesterday all the shows. But like uh, after a few days, uh, then they offered me the Michael Johnson fight, and I was even happier. So. I don't have injury after my fight. Uh, I gained, of course, a little weight, you know, and I fought many times in lightweight. Uh, I'm tall, so I can definitely fight a big, big lightweight fight. And since uh, Michael Johnson is a striker as well, um, uh, I didn't, I don't really need much um, 
much preparation specifically if when they are strikers or if it's a wrestler on a jiu-jitsu i'll take a little time and gonna get a good camp uh, and gonna fight anybody right. but if it's like one week notice fight and the guy's a striker and i'm a striker all, all my life i would love to fight it because i about striking all i know about striking i can fight all day just it's my hobby as well. It's not just a uh, sport for me, you know. So I took this uh, offer and after a few days and I see these two guys matching up together. And I was like, huh? Like the karma worked against Michael Johnson. This guy, I was asked to fight both of these guys. I said no and there, nothing happened. And after, after um, one hour when this fight announced and my manager calls me and he's saying that uh there's an opportunity uh against uh gabriel benitez at 145 right. at 25 march i was like super happy that finally uh there was opportunity in 145 i said okay <laughs> let's go um and then i talked to sean shelby sean shelby say yes uh, uh probably you're gonna fight 25 april uh against gabriel and gabriel is a uh, higher ranked uh, for now than me sure. and that would be the great jump for me to go front and uh, i accepted this fight as well but yeah suddenly dana said this bad news for us and here here we are that's crazy that they asked you about comma then they asked you about michael and they end up booking them <laughs> and, and together, they, they're yeah. going wait a minute what happened? I was supposed <laughs> to fight both of them, and now they're fighting each other. Maybe, and maybe it was because of what you said, though. Maybe it's because they were trying to get you a featherweight fight. Um, but then again, now everything fell apart, so it it almost doesn't matter at this point. No, I understand everything. Uh, what happened? Because uh, Karma had the opponent Otman, uh, and uh, same time, the Michael Johnson had the European opponent, and these two guys uh, were uh, scheduled on event to event, like next to each other and so probably they matched the two lightweights they didn't have both of them opponents they were both scheduled and they just uh, matched to each other and it was a good fight for them both of the guys are strikers and um, yeah i think that that, that that i understand and then uh, this, this miguel benitez offer was uh for me and that would be the great that would I that would have, so been a, that would have been a good fight. So, you know, obviously everybody in every division, you know, they want to be a champion. And Absolutely. so I want to ask you a question, and I want you to leave the champion out of it. Um, is there a particular fight in the UFC, a particular fighter in the featherweight division that would you consider um, a dream fight? You know, somebody that you absolutely want to fight, regardless of a title, just a dream fight uh, for somebody that's active today on the roster. For this moment, uh, dream fight would be, of course, Conor McGregor. He's the biggest payday. Everyone chasing to fight him. Uh, uh, that would be the dream fight for now. But I'm going to tell you something good. Okay. Um, I believe that I have the skills that soon, very soon, uh, I'll be one of the fighters that uh, people will be, hey, I want to watch Kika fight. Because I've been in kickboxing and I've been in karate and all my life, after a couple of my of my fights, all, all the fans uh, who watch my fights, they, they really wanted me to see in, in a show. And I feel that after a few good highlights, that uh, question when you ask to different opponents, they, they're going to tell you that I want to fight Kika. <laughs> So for me, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I would love to fight some strikers, big names, as a, like Yair Rodriguez is a great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I feel like um, Korean Zombie is good. Uh, somebody who makes a nice show, Zabit, uh, I believe one day we're gonna fight. Um, but for now, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a couple of steps we have uh, and then probably will be some big nice name fight <laughs> big nice name fight with big paychecks at the end big so uh, paychecks, yeah yep so you can make all the money you need and then retire 
and go back to Georgia on your land, eat the food you want to eat, and be around the people you want to be with. Maybe I'll open a restaurant here and eat the food right here. You know, you know. I'll, I'll be coming to Huntington Beach to try it out. <laughs> So yeah, um, I I start loving this place, man. The Huntington Beach. The, if I show you outside the, how the sky looks, you're gonna oh, love it. It's it's amazing. I was just in Los Angeles uh, in February. One of my good friends got married, and um, I've been out there a couple of times. And while we were out there, we drove by all the beach areas and everything. I, it's so yeah. pretty out there. The weather's nice, and great, they have yeah. they have and they have recreational marijuana. <laughs> it's always, yeah, a bonus. <laughs> it's always a bonus always a bonus yeah. so um you uh you know like i said you came over from kickboxing and from karate um and you've retired from kickboxing um mm -hmm. as a career uh do you miss it like competing on a high level do you i miss love it? it i love it i love it we have a. Uh... Um, I, as I told, uh, as you guys know, I train at King's MMA. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, we have uh, every Friday so sparring, uh, more like a kickboxing style. I mean, we we we're using the boxing gloves and we spar MMA, but uh, re wrestling to do with boxing gloves is kind of hard. So it's pretty yeah. much like striking sparring. Uh, that's my the most uh, like the best time of the week when it's a Friday, eleven o'clock. <laughs> you can see the Giga how happy he is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have some I have some comments on here. Um, sure, I'm guessing that are I can't read. I guess they're in your native language. So I'm gonna pop it on the screen. Um, what does uh, that say? Somebody asked. Somebody asked me to. Uh, touch my chin if I see. I don't know why, but okay, right here. <laughs> is that all that? Is that, that, is that all that says? Touch your chin? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. Because <laughs> he, he had a he had another he had this comment as well. We are proud of you. Oh, okay, it's great. And then I saw the other one. I'm like, I don't know what the hell that says. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. <laughs> so um yeah it says that touch your chin if you see the comments so, and then, yeah i know it's a morning so in georgia is this guy in, 11 hour difference is he in georgia right now i'm guessing yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. that's awesome we're touching the world right now that's <laughs> great international exposure i love it um <laughs> there was a question on here nope that ain't a question that's not nothing else um so yeah, the kickboxing. You know, when I as soon as I said kickboxing, do you miss it? Your face got so happy, like your smile went from here all the way to here, um, and, and your your it's eyes. It's my hobby. Your yeah, eyes were smiling. Hobby. Let's say if I if I'm uh, if I'm having uh, if I'm on a bad mood or I don't know, like yeah. I just my thing isn't going uh, well. I just go and spar with my teammates, and I come home as happy as. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's awesome, man. It, it's nice to see somebody being able to achieve something and watch their journey, um, you know, and try something new, you know, and not be afraid to do it. You know, karate to kickboxing um, and then to MMA, even going into MMA with not a lot of experience in all the disciplines that you need to know, you still did it. And that takes big, heavy duty balls. <laughs> Yeah, I guess uh, I do have them. <laughs> <laughs> you do, sir. You do. Um, let me ask you a question. The first MMA fight that you had, um, did you have any, and I don't want to say were you afraid because I don't think you're afraid to fight anybody, but was there a little fear of the unknown the first time you actually competed in a pro MMA fight? Uh, I think only uh, only idiots gonna tell you that you know, when I fight MMA first time, I don't have any 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 feeling of the fear. Uh, I'm, a, I'm I'm I've been fighting since I was four years old. So when my dad took me at on karate school, and since then I've been competing at tournaments. And even I'm 31 years old, and now I'm fighting in the UFC. Uh, I always had some kind of feeling which uh, makes me like 
kind of excited makes me uh, i would not say too much like a afraid or or i don't know if it is maybe it's a fear kind of feeling but it's not same time fear but yeah of course i had this feeling when when i fought first mma uh, I'm, I'm a very emotional person <laughs> i had in my country when i grew up when i was a kid i had a lot of uh, street fights as well uh, and uh, every time it's a weird situation a weird feeling for me that every time i had the some kind of fight it would be in the streets or, so, or somewhere i was uh, losing my the voice and lo- i couldn't really barely was could talk well you know i was a uh, little some kind of uh, shaking of face and yeah that uh, happened sometimes to me but uh, as more professional I'm becoming, uh, as less it is. Uh, let's say the 10 years ago, I was not uh, sleeping at all before my fight the night before. Now I can, I can, I know that I need to sleep, so uh, to gain uh, extra energy, and I always sleep well. Hey, it's a less uh, stress now, but uh, yeah, about the uh, first MMA fight, uh, it was a. Uh, Good, uh, good time. <laughs> I came out from hospital the month before. I was uh, two weeks uh, in hospital. From I got a strep, streptococcus infection, which is uh, much worse than stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I was uh, dealing with this thing for two weeks in hospital. They could not find out first what was it. They were talking about uh, cutting my hand. Uh, and same time, my wife was pregnant, and it was a very stressful period for me and my fight was already scheduled and this fight um, uh, i got a contract from world series which was a big uh, which was a big league at the, at the moment without uh, zero zero without zero uh, zero experience in mma so zero i was zero and zero and uh, when i came out from hospital this pushed me to come back fast so next day i went after surgery and I started to train, and uh, in four weeks I made my debut in PF uh, World Series of Fighting WS or FF Mont. That's crazy, man! That's awesome. Yeah, um, it was crazy for me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, earlier today, when you came on to do a test to make sure this worked, um, by the way, how'd that go with the dentist? Everything good? Everything is great. My friend. All right. Good. Um, I had mentioned that you um, had a booking um, that you were supposed to fight. Um, Michael Davis, who's a guy I have a lot of experience with. I was a ring announcer for all his pro fights until he got into the UFC. Um, sure. That that bout was scheduled, I believe, uh, for February 29th. And both of you ended up pulling out for various reasons. Um, you were talking about, you know, wanting to fight a guy that's a striker, you know, that, that likes to strike. Um, Michael Davis, Mike Davis, the beast boy, He's a striker. He likes to strike. I mean, he has groundwork and everything, but like you, he likes to stand up and beat the crap out of people. That's what he loves to do. So that fight got canceled. Um, when the UFC goes back to business, is that another? Is that a fight you would still like to take? Um, probably you don't have uh, like the uh, whole information about this fight. I'm going to tell you the story of how okay. it was. Uh, the the way how I got in UFC, the, this was this uh, opponent was offered for me. So the Mike uh, didn't have opponent in September for 28 uh, opponent, uh, and uh, I, I was asked if I wanted to replace it in short notice, and I was super happy to get the contract. I didn't care who it was, it was Michael or uh, anybody else. <laughs> And I took the fight, and the next day I hear that, okay, he didn't take the fight. And I thought I lost the fight, I lost the contract as well of the UFC. And I was very pissed on this. I got mad. I didn't know if they're going to replace a new opponent or they're going to keep my contract. And um, they finally gave me the Brandon Davis. After that, they scheduled me with Mike Davis and... uh, I never pulled out from the fight. Uh, Mike pulled out. Uh, I was still waiting for a new opponent to come. And that's why they matched me after one week show, March uh, 7th. Um, 
Yeah, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm very. I was not happy at all because I, I stayed, uh, you know, for in you know, Christmas and uh, New Year's here. I sent my family in Georgia. We always go there to celebrate. And sure. Only the reason why I stayed here to do my camp and to do a good fight against Michael, uh, March twenty, uh, February twenty-nine, and uh, then he uh, pulled out, and uh, I was very, very. Unhappy on that, and uh, then I heard uh, some kind of information that the guy was uh, he was injured earlier, and he didn't say this. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't feel that I, I must be fighting him again because um, he kind of pulled out twice from my fight. The first time he didn't accept, and second time he pulled out. And uh, I, most of the times, uh, I had uh, short notice fights, especially the second one that I put so much hard work. And uh, uh, I, I think I'm going to look for the Gabriel Benitez for this. Yeah. Well, for, as a fight fan, the matchup, uh, you and Mike, uh, because of the striking things that you both like to do, those are the fights I like to see, you know, like, you know, like you said, you like to fight strikers that want to stand because standing and punching and kicking, you'll do that with your eyes closed and you'll still be successful because you, Absolutely. like you said, yeah, that's you, what, that's what's 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 what I was goal. looking for February. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it'll happen. Um, I'd like to see the fight um, because the, the potential excitement on there, um, because again, you guys both like to stand and bang. Um, and when that story I mean, first we might fight in the street first, you know, <laughs> if, I, if I see him, yeah. And, and when that but. story first came out, um, because I remember reading an article, um, I was actually out of town myself, so I wasn't working on any articles myself or videos. Um, and I remember hearing that, um, he had pulled out, he had injury, and then uh, right after that happened, um, somebody had told me that you had like an injury or something you were trying to recover from the, anyway, so that, that's what I had heard, no, no, so. No. No no, 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 no. I'm glad you told me how it happened because, uh, you know. No, I, I just fought. So next, uh, so right. 29 February, I was uh, scheduled and I fought to 7 March. Uh, was like eight or nine days notice fight. I took this. Yeah, and, no, uh, I, I'm very, very well known with this. I took the short notice glory debut uh, many times in a glory yeah. fight. And both of my fights in UFC was short notice and even the one uh, it was going to happen with Karma, Worthy, or Michael Jones, or, or even Gabriel right. Benitez. All of these fights would be the short notice. But, uh, and even I thought, uh, as I told you last month, I don't mind. But since I don't have any injury, if it's a striker, I'm going to take the fight right now. <laughs> In one hour, I'm going to fight. <laughs> um, maybe one of these days, you'll get a full training camp in once we get back to the regular UFC business. Um, sure. Uh, because I, I think, you know, if, if you've answered the call on short notice, the next fight they give you, they should give you plenty of time to prepare, give you a full camp. Because we're taking a fight on short notice, you know, like you said, you don't get all the proper training in that you want to have going into a fight, even as much as getting your cardio where you want it to be. Um, mm -hmm. So a full fight camp for Giga Chikadze in the UFC interests me. Because if you're doing this on short notice now, uh, what happened? Oh, that was weird. If you're doing it on short notice now, imagine what we'll see if you get full fight camps. Uh, you say again, please. What will be the difference if I have a good yeah, camp? Because you're doing good now with no fight camp, you know, short notice. So, <laughs> so if you get eight weeks of camp, I think we should expect a lot more. Um, yeah, absolutely. If you guys have seen my fights, all my the first rounds in USC, both of my fights were pretty exciting. Uh, uh, I almost finished both of the guys, uh, both of my opponents in the first round. And uh, and uh, if I have a proper, like a good camp against uh, the opponent, the same opponent who's going to show up in the fight, it will, it will be a fire for either will be three round fire, but <laughs> I'm gonna chase them every second to knock them out. You know? That's right. what I do. That's what I love to do. That's awesome, and that's as as a not just a member of the media, but just as a fan of the sport. 
Um, I love guys with that attitude. You know, I love the whole sport. I can watch a good, you know, grappling match where guys are really transitioning and, you know, there's good sweeps and submission attempts. And I love that too, because that's an art form in its own. But at the end of the day, I don't care who you are. Even jujitsu guys love the knockout. So, you know, everyone loves knockouts. That's, that's, that's what it. people love to watch it, right? That's it. And like you said, a couple more fights from you, get those big wins. People are going to be saying, I want to fight Giga. I like that. <laughs> so, um, I was supposed to tell you something this afternoon that I tell all my first time guests, and I didn't tell you. So, because I always ask my guests to do something special on the show. So if you say Dude. no, if you say no, I'm not even going to be mad because I didn't give you any warning. But can you read the comment? When I have, I'll tell you what it says. If this is your first time on the show, every first time, every time somebody jumps on for the very first time, we ask them to sing anything they want. Oh, singing. <laughs> yeah. We ask them to sing anything uh, they want. I'm very bad in that. I'm hey. super bad in that. I don't want somebody recording to use it uh, in the future. Funny highlights. But I don't know. Like, what should, I, what should I try to sing? You can sing whatever you want. You can sing happy birthday if you want. You can sing. You, you know what would be cool? You know uh, I'll, be, I'll be prepared for the next one. I'm going to try to sing it. You know what would be cool? If you could sing something for us in your native language. Uh, I'm not even good in this. I you know I can talk a lot. I can fight a lot. I might be good in dancing too, but not in singing, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> that's the whole thing. Yeah, actually, that's so funny that Benny, Benny Ildari, which probably know who's he, UFC, yes. one of yes. the top lightweight. Uh, he had a dance, uh, he had a, not dance, he had a marriage, uh, uh, 2nd of February, yeah, 2nd of, no, 1st of February. And all our team, the Marvin Vettori, Calvin Gastelum, a couple of other fighters, I don't remember the who who were there, <laughs> but we we got a little, <laughs> we had a little fun there, and then we started dancing. It's like he's an Assyrian, uh, and Assyrian culture has a big uh, wedding parties, like uh, three or 400 people they had. Uh, it's very familiar to my my country how they celebrate the marriage, and then we started the dancing. And guess what? Who was the best dancer? <laughs> Giga Chikate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. All right, <laughs> but so, not not the singing. I'm sorry, my friend. I no, cannot listen, sing. But the next time you come on, you got to have something ready to sing. Just a little. It doesn't even have to be a whole song, um, because okay, well, I'll try. I'll try, especially in and, Georgia. Yeah. Yeah, and you know. I won't. I won't. Yeah, I won't get mad now because I'm supposed to warn people ahead of time so they have time to think about it, and I forgot. So um, my buddy Forrest is going to be so mad right now. He's like, ah. <laughs> but um, I just want to say thank you for taking the time. Sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, an honor to meet you and talk with you. And uh, you know, um, the fact that you agreed to do my show, even though you know I'm not the big media, but I am out there working hard like you do in your sport. This is my my sport. <laughs> so. Um, I could talk my way out of anything, but I, I don't know about fighting my way out of anything. So, you know, so I fight with this, you fight with these, and, and the world is balanced. We all fight these days, my friend. We all fight, man. yeah. But uh, at the end, from home now. Yeah. At the end of the day, though, we're all just, uh, whatever you do in life, we're all people. It doesn't matter how much money you have or where you come from or what color your skin is or what religion you follow. You're just a human being. I'm just a human being, and this is what makes life, meeting other human beings and learning different things. We keep things. moving forward, yes. Be open-minded and, you know, be willing to help somebody if they need it, you know, and uh, that's how we all get through everything in life, together, not separate. I agree on everything what he's just said. <laughs> well, listen, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Um, you know, go out there and do some dancing, maybe do a little karate, <laughs> a little kickboxing to this weekend, and... Uh, I hope you and your family in, um, enjoy the weekend. And uh, I can't wait to get an announcement when you fight. As soon as you get a fight announcement, I'll reach out. We'll bring you back on the show. And uh, we'll uh, preview your uh, next fight in the UFC. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you get a full camp for it uh, because then I, I expect 
your game to go from here to right out the sky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Dedicated athletes make it happen. And seeing your track record in karate and kickboxing only says to me that as you evolve into this, you'll have your success that you want. So um, I appreciate you taking the time, man. And, uh, you know, we're going to be happy to watch your journey as you uh, climb up the ranks of the UFC. Uh, before you Thank go, you yep. yeah, and before you go, um, I always tell everybody to uh, give out their social media, you know, your Instagram, all that stuff, so people can follow you if they aren't already. And uh, you know, hopefully, we'll get you a few followers added to there. Uh, you know, I, I get a sure. decent crowd on here sometimes. You know, <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so, guys, my Instagram I run as uh, same as my charity fund called Knockout Cancer with the hashtag no culture cancer. Uh, and uh, my Facebook page is just my name, Giga Chikaze. You guys can find there. Yeah, but it's right there on and, the screen, uh, guys. He spelled it exactly how you, that's how you look it up. Exactly, yes. And what's the, and, um, uh, the Instagram think, uh, uh, My Instagram is knockout cancer. Knockout cancer, that's your Instagram handle? Yes. Wow. Um, just at... Let me put that on the screen here for everybody. All one word, or is there a hyphen or an underscore? Uh, no, just no cancer, uh, cancer is one word. I don't have everybody on my Instagram, so I'm going to have to go follow you. Uh, sure. Uh, let me do this right here before you go. Do, 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 do. Uh, scroll across the bottom and banner and then we'll scroll that one so did i get that right knockout cancer on instagram for giga chikaze perfect perfect so i'm gonna let that run here for a minute um so that way you guys can get it um uh, follow him on instagram like on facebook just like it's spelled that's how i got in touch with him you know uh i reached out and uh i got lucky he uh, hit me back up and i appreciate it <laughs> That's how I get all my. That's how I've met a lot of people, UFC guys. I always try to stay the really pretty active uh, with my followers and fans. And Good. I'm an athlete. You know, we try to grow the sport together, and that was all we can do. That is all we can do. All right. Well, listen. Again, uh, enjoy the weekend. Thank you for being here. Honored to meet you and Thank chat you. with you and uh, learn a little bit more about you from you rather than what other people write about or say, you know, it's always good to hear it from the athlete themselves because then you always get the truth. So I appreciate you uh, sharing some of your life with us today. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We'll see you soon. Um, Thanks okay. for having me, my friend, and uh, have a great weekend, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, guys, that's Giga Jakarta. He's checking out. Um, unfortunately, Brock Weaver still has some technical issues that we couldn't get worked out for him in time, so we're going to try to have him on the show on Monday. Um, I apologize if you were here to see him. Um, he also asked me to send his apologies to you guys. Um, he wishes he could be on with us tonight. Um, but uh, there was an issue with the software and, and, you know, whatever. I can't even explain on his end. Um, but so we'll get him on at the beginning of the week next week. Um, I will be back on Monday, hopefully with Brock Weaver and a couple other guests. Um, sorry, Giga didn't sing. I didn't warn him for us. That's my fault. So I can't get mad if he says no because I gave him no heads up. Um, I appreciate you guys tuning in tonight. I hope you had a good time with my guests um, from Iridium Sports Agency, Mr. Jason House, uh, Joe Selecki, UFC lightweight up on the rise, training out in North Carolina and pretty much South Carolina and Tennessee and uh, so many places I can't remember them all. And then Mr. Giga Chikaze joining us, a former glory kickboxing world champion, karate world champion, UFC fighter. Um, guy's talented. He's got a lot of game to show, and uh, the improvements will come as he gets these full camps and works on his ground game. And uh, he's already proven that he can adapt. And, uh, you know, with training, I think uh, we'll see uh, a lot of good stuff. Um, thanks, everybody, tuning in. Thanks for letting me be a part of your day today and you guys being a part of my life. I appreciate more than words can say. Until next time, I am Christopher James. You've been K-Side. Good night.
Happy Easter to those that celebrate. Happy Passover to those that celebrated that also. Well, be good. We are out of here.